Good afternoon. My name is Ron Madler. I'm the Dean of the College of Engineering here on the Prescott campus of Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Welcome to our Engineering Week Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, it's my distinct honor to introduce our friend and colleague, Dr. Richard Holdaway. Some of you remember, may remember the name. Last year, Dr. Holdaway gave a six-part series on a journey through space and time from the November through the February, March timeframe, just before COVID hit. So we're pleased to bring him back to talk about something a little bit different. Last time it was all about space kind of stuff, which is, uh, we have a shared background in that. This time he's gonna talk about a different project that uh, he's been involved with on uh, basically making sure we don't have any lapses in coverage uh, in our cell service around the country and, and a, a unique platform for doing that. Uh, we're really lucky to have Dr. Holdaway here for six months of the year. Uh, the other six months of the year, you'll notice from his accent, it might be from somewhere else. And so I, and I, I love reading his, um, his biography because it's different than what we might have on this side of the pond. And so I, I wanna read a few things uh, of his background. And so Dr. Holdaway has been, uh, uh, worked for 45 years on a lot of multinational space programs. And so he's worked with China, Russia, Japan, United States, NASA, and all kinds of other uh, international organizations. Uh, and this is because he was uh, one of the directors for the Rutherford Appleton uh, Laboratories, the late, later called the Space, space uh, RAL Space. Uh, now he's a, a non-executive director for Stratospheric Platforms, which is based, based in uh, uh, Cambridge, UK. And that's kind of leading to today's talk. You know, when you, when you bring in uh, distinguished speakers like this, they often have you know, a lot of different uh, I interesting backgrounds, but uh, he's also a fellow of the British Royal Academy of Engineering. He's also a, a fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, a few of the other international organizations. But my favorite one is that he is a commander of the Order of the British Empire, given by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. I mean, not many people can say uh, that kind of a thing. So it's uh, without any more ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Richard Holdaway. Uh, the, myself and some of the technicians are gonna be in the back of the room. So we're gonna uh, uh, be back there so there's plenty of spacing so Dr. Holdaway can take down his mask and it'll be a little bit easier for you all to understand. So with that, thank you for joining us, Dr. Holdaway. Dr. Madder, if I can get the mask off, that's a little bit easier said than done. So thank you very much indeed uh, for inviting me here to Embry-Riddle. It's always a great pleasure and honor to, to come here and to meet with the staff and to meet with the, the students. Um, <clears throat> as uh, Dr. Madler said, uh, and as you can tell, I come from a slightly different part of the world. Uh, in fact, we live uh, near Oxford in England six months of the year and the other six months of the year. We're very lucky to be living here in, uh, in Prescott. So for this talk, I'm going to talk uh, around about 30 minutes, uh, maybe a little more, uh, and then there'll be plenty of time for Q&A. The talk is a about a program that I'm involved with uh, at the moment, as Dr. Madler said, but really the bottom line is it's about innovation. So while I'm talking, just think about the innovative aspects of, of the things I'm going to cover. In, uh, in the US, you have a, a program on TV which many of you will be familiar with called Shark Tank. And in the UK, we have a sort of equivalent uh, called Dragon's Den. But the, th the theory of both programs is the same. So entrepreneurs, inventors come up in front of a panel of, of investors and they give a pitch. And they give a pitch for whatever it is that they've been working on and are looking for in investment. Now, I, I'm not here today talking about investment, but it's interesting that on those two programs, Shark Tank and Dragon's Den, probably a third, maybe on a good week, a half, of those that come in and, and pitch actually get an investment. But the reasons why they don't get investment generally is one of two different possibilities. One is they just plain don't know their numbers. And this is the criticism that comes up time and time again. And by that I mean they have no idea actually for their invention what the cost of the goods is, 
what the cost of marketing is, what the cost of sales are, and particularly what their P&L is, both now and projected forward. The other reason that quite a high percentage of the presenters fail on, and the, the, the dragons and the sharks have different ways of telling them this, is that they're trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist, or they're trying to solve a problem that does exist, but they're solving it the wrong way. So having said that, and bearing in mind that, as I said, this is not an investment pitch, so I'm not going through numbers, at least not the financial numbers, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? Well, the first problem is that, as we all know to our cost, there's a problem with mobile cell phones, which is when they work, they work very well, a bit like the photocopier. But when they don't work, it is incredibly frustrating. And this is what typically happens. You're trying to make a call, you find you, you've got no signal. Sometimes even in a built-up area, you've got no signal, and you yell at the phone, at least I do, and I'm sure many of you do as well. It, it's intensely frustrating. And here in Prescott, um, an area which I know pretty well now, you'll be familiar with the fact that if you go to places like Frontier Village, up on the, on the highway, there's almost no cell coverage anywhere there. Up Thumb Butte, very famous landmark for the city, again, not much coverage. On the main highways, 69, 89, quite a few areas where there's no coverage. Just two days ago, I was hiking down the Grand Canyon. It took me 10 hours there and back, and for the whole of that 10 hours, there was no cell coverage. And not only that, but when I got back to, to Grand Canyon Village, and for those of you who don't know it, it's quite a lively village, really a, 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 a small town, there was no coverage there either. A and really, that's not very acceptable in the day and age in which we live, when we're trying to get connectivity from people around the globe. So that's the first problem. It's the dark spots. So we're looking to overcome that. The second is that we have a huge reliance on cell phone towers. We see them everywhere. Uh, at the moment, there are something like 200,000 towers around the US, and that's taking into account the fact that a lot of the continental US doesn't have cell phone coverage. So just the areas that do, about 200,000. But to deliberately misquote Al Johnson from about, I think it was 90 years ago, um, when he was on Broadway in The Jazz Singer, uh, to misquote what he said, there may be 200,000 uh, towers now, but you ain't seen nothing yet. To get coverage across the whole of continental US, and with 5G coming, you need at least 2 million. So 200,000 now, 2 million for 5G coverage. And so that's not only a factor of at least five and probably near a 10 in terms of the number of towers, there's a huge amount of energy goes into making those towers and installing them. And not only that, but as we go beyond 5G, and of course most areas in the US actually don't have 5G anyway at the moment, it's really only the big cities. When it's rolled out beyond in Arizona, beyond Phoenix, and comes up here, and by the time it's got to all the other towns and cities in the States, we will already be working on 6G and probably beginning to think about 7G. That's going to require even more towers. So that's the problem. Now, what is the solution? So there are really three options. One is, this may be a British expression, but which in case apologies, um, but it's the grin and bear it. It's to keep the British stiff upper lip. So you don't do what you saw in the previous slide, which is yell at your cell phone. You just say, that's life. Um, however, as you can see on the slide, it is still very, very frustrating. Then there are balloons. The problem with high altitude balloons, high altitude because you've got to get coverage so of sufficient width on the ground, is that they are inherently unstable in terms of their position because of the winds up there, and their attitude, the, their pointing di direction, their stability, is also pretty unstable. 
And in fact, Google tried uh, a program with balloons until fairly recently, a program called Google Loon. They abandoned that last week, having spent a lot of money, I can tell you, on the whole program, and found that it just wasn't feasible. Then there's the option of satellites, and there are a number of constellations being built at the moment of, of satellites, primarily for broadband, but broadband coverage has a different requirement to cell phone coverage, and the problem with cell phone coverage, if you go through uh, a satellite, even if it's a low Earth altitude uh, satellite, is that you've got long latency, at least relatively speaking, and that's the delay between you speaking, the message getting up to the satellite, through the satellite system, and back down to someone else. It's, it's irritatingly long. And the other problem that satellites have when you're trying to communicate with many, many people is that satellites just have insufficient power. There's a third possibility, however, and that's something called a HAPS or a UAV. So it's a high altitude platform. Well, a balloon is a platform, but a different sort of platform. This is uh, an unmanned uh, aerial vehicle. So it's a UAV. It's a whacking great big uh, drone. It's, it's a little bit like uh, a standard aircraft, um, but has completely different capabilities. So let me just compare, first of all, the uh, pro program that, that we're developing with the HAPS uh, and a satellite. The writing's a little bit small, but I hope you can see it. Um, first of all, handset compatibility. The problem with satellite system, and, and we've seen it, of course, through programs like Iridium, is that you need some sort of additional equipment on the ground, whereas a handset, as we'll see later on, is completely compatible. And I'll show you how compatible it is uh, a little bit later. Secondly, maneuverability. When you're first setting up a system, you've got almost unlimited capability with a HAPS program of where you put your planes and how you manage the coverage on the ground. With satellites, of course, you can't do that. Satellites go round and round, and Kepler and Einstein, Ke Kepler and um, Newton bet between them figured out the motion of the satellites, and there's nothing we can do about that. They follow the, the track on the orbit they're in, and you can't do anything about it, at least nothing significant about it. Scalability, you can't easily send up quickly a lot more satellites. If you run into problems or you need greater coverage in particular areas, you can with HAPS. And upgradability is the other big issue. Once a satellite, of course, is up there, you can't upgrade it. With a HAPS, you can, because as we'll see, the HAPS go up, they do their stuff for a while, they come back down. When they come back down and there is new technology in a year or two or three, you can upgrade that technology very well. There is one other issue with, with HAPS, however, and that is that th there are a number of, of high-altitude platforms, uh, UAVs, around at the moment being developed. They're all powered by solar cells. Now, that's great in the sense that the energy is free and non-polluting, but there is a major problem, which is that they only operate effectively between about plus and minus 30 degrees latitude, because any further north or any further south and the incident radiation from the sun, which of course is what powers the solar cells, is too small. So they can't really operate effectively above 30 or below 30, particularly, of course, as at night time, you've got no illumination of the solar panels, so you've got to carry batteries up, and batteries are very, very heavy, as we know. So we have a potential solution. We have a potential solution which we believe works, and we believe that we have a way around this plus or minus 30 degrees. So at this point, it's welcome to the future of global communications. And the company that uh, I'm working with as a non-exec director is called Stratospheric Platforms. And it's the next generation of 5G. And you may think, well, 5G is already here. But as I said, it's, it has very limited rollout. In the UK, there are probably five or six cities that have 5G, and that's it. It's a long way off having 5G within the whole of the US or within the whole of the UK or indeed Europe, never mind other parts of the world which are mo more di um, di diversified. So the background to Stratospheric Platforms Limited or SPL 
uh, and its technology. When the idea was first conceived, what on earth made us think that we had the capability to do something that other people were doing? And the answer is that we had identified two key technologies that we had access to that we could use in a highly innovative way. First of all, there's the Square Kilometre Array Program. This is uh, a science-led astronomy program. It's a program that involves uh, 14 different countries, so it's, it's mega uh, intergovernmental. It's a radio telescope. Uh, and it covers the frequency 50 megahertz up to about 14 gigs, which is more or less what you need, as it turns out, for the mobile phone system. So SKA, as I said, is a, is a science program. It, its purpose in life is, is to investigate the early formation of the galaxies, to try and understand something about an issue that, of which we know very little at the moment, which is dark energy. Dark energy is the issue which is pushing galaxies apart at faster speed than they should be, um, as opposed to dark, uh, ma uh, dark matter, which is what's actually bringing some galaxies closer together. We know very little about dark energy, very little about dark matter. With SKA, we should learn a lot more about dark energy and gravitational waves as well, which are the gravitational equivalents of the ripple you get when you throw a pebble into a pond and you see the, the ripples moving outwards from where you threw the pebble, or rather where the pebble landed. Exactly the same thing with gravity waves. There's another little aspect to uh, SKA which I really like, which is called verifying Einstein. Now, I like that because Einstein is my absolute hero. And unlike some theoreticians, um, almost n nothing that Einstein said has ever been proven wrong. So with SKA, they're going to try and see whether they, they can find anything. And my hope certainly is that they'll find that absolutely uh, Einstein was correct in, in, in everything that he proposed. But the whole point about this technology, and you can see in the pictures there, there are two types of, of arrays. One looks like a standard antenna that transmits to and from satellites. The other is a series of, of uh, aerials that look a little bit more like the old-fashioned UHF and VHF aerials that we were all accustomed to uh, 20, 30 years ago. But they're very powerful systems. They can see right to the very edge of the universe. And our concept here is to take that same technology and turn it upside down. And instead of pointing it out in the sky, we're pointing it down to the ground and using the carrier for that technology to be able to transmit mobile uh, cell phone systems. I should add as well that the whole of the SK program is going to cost something in excess of a billion dollars. A lot of that has already been spent. And so we have a lot of money that's been spent by other organizations developing the technology which we're now able to take and put on our platform. The other thing that we need is an ultra lightweight and very long duration platform that can carry the communications package and can do it stably and efficiently. So what, how do we actually put the, the company together in the first place? It was spun out from Cavendish Laboratory uh, at Cambridge in, in the UK. I say Cambridge in the UK because you've got the other famous universities, MIT and, and uh, Harvard in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but this is ca uh, Cambridge, UK. Cavendish Lab is famous worldwide for all sorts of things, not the least of which that they've produced 29 Nobel Prize winners in physics, chemistry, and medicine across the years. So they're pretty bright guys. So we spun the company out from Cavendish Lab. We brought in some of the key experts from the square, square kilometer array, from the aeronautics industry, because obviously we have to have a platform to fly the communications package on. ATC is air traffic control, because clearly if we're flying lots of platforms up there, and I'll talk about where there is, we need to be able to fly in and through and actually above the main airspace that commercial aircraft fly in. So we needed experts there. And of course, like all organizations, we need finance experts. We need a lot of money as well. So we went out and sought investment from all sorts of different organizations, and in the end, 
we were very, very fortunate that we were able to convince a major player um, in the mobile cell phone network, which was Deutsche Telekom. And we had an investment of very close to $100 million. And at that time, I think there were, from memory, there were eight, maybe 10, 10 of us in the company. So I think it was, the, it was probably the highest or very close to the highest investment into a university spin-out ever uh, in the UK. We worked for the first five years in stealth mode. Uh, and the reason for that is because we believed, as did our investors, that the technology was so innovative that we had to basically keep it secret. Now, of course, you can do that by setting up a, an, an equivalent of the black program that Lockheed and Boeing and others uh, have had, where you people know what you're doing, but you, you just don't talk about it. We wanted to be even more careful than that because if you're doing something and it's secret, people will always be able to find out something about what you're doing. We didn't want to do that because A, we didn't want our potential rivals to know what we were doing, uh, and B, we didn't want to know, we didn't want not just other potential rivals, but other operators of mobile networks to see what we were doing and give them a, a, a head start as well. So for five years, there was no publicity, nothing on the web. Um, the little bit in brackets there, it says Inc. IOM HQ Reg, that's including Isle of Man, which is a little island off the coast of the UK. Uh, that's where we registered the company. The reason for registering there is that although it's a tax haven, which wasn't relevant to us particularly, they have slightly different laws. If you set up a company, you do not have to say who the directors of the company are. And of course, what we wanted to avoid was not only the, the rest of the world knowing what the company was doing, we didn't want them to know who the directors were because that would give them a clue as to what we were doing. And three of the directors were members of, of uh, Deutsche Telekom. So if, if people saw there were names from a mobile network operator, they would say, hey, clearly they're doing something on mobile comms. So that was the reason for that. So it is something very important as an entrepreneur. You've got to protect your, your IP, your intellectual property. And however you do it, it doesn't matter. You have to be very protective. And we developed the key technologies in Harris, which were the comms and the, and the uh, power. So we had the communications expertise in Cambridge for the, for the, the whole of the comms program. We had people, myself included, but others that had worked in the aerospace industry. Uh, but we'd never been involved in something that was big and going to be flying very high. So we had already spoken to some people in Germany who had built, oh sorry, who had designed and partly built and worked with builders, the world's largest glider. And this is it, the, the small picture top left and the big picture. That's the glider, it's, it's got a 100 foot wingspan. So it really is very, very large. Uh, and it was designed, as I said, by a company in Germany. And they did the conceptual design for a stratospheric platform. And I'll come into a moment what the stratosphere is and why. But it had to be lightweight, it had to be incredible aerodynamics because it's got to fly very high and carry a very big payload. So the aerodynamics was fundamental. So we went to the basically the best engineers and the best theoreticians for gliders in the world. And they worked with us for the first three years, I think it was. They also built some sections of the full-scale model, which is bigger than, much bigger than this model here, this flying glider here. So they built some sections and they tested them for destruction. So at the end of the first three years, we had a communications package prototype that we were able to test. We had the concept of the UAV that we were pretty confident would work. And then we were able to get on to the next stage. So we took the design of the glider and we went around different parts of the world to talk about to talk to people that could build a much bigger uh, aeroplane. And the one you see here is the design that came back uh, from a company not far from here. This was designed by Scale Composites in Mojave. Those are the guys that have built um, powered gliders that go have gone around the world and also, of course, have uh, developed the White Knight 
plane for Richard Branson for Virgin Galactic. So we were dealing with real experts there. And, and here is the basis of the uh, aircraft. It's got to carry a 140 kilogram payload. It's got to be able to stay, stay up for ni ni nine days minimum. The wingspan of this plane is 200 feet, so it's twice the width of the, the world's largest glider. As it happens, 200 feet is about the wingspan of a jumbo 747. So it is a massive vehicle. And its operational altitude is, is 60,000 feet. So those were the key requirements we gave to, to scale composites. And what they came back with was the picture you see there. In addition, we had to overcome this problem of going above 30 north or below 30 south. And we concluded very early on in the, the thought process, which is what you know all entrepreneurs go through, that we needed hydrogen as the main fuel source. So a hydrogen fuel tank to give us not only the ability to get up to 60,000 feet and stay there for, for uh, a minimum of nine days, but to provide a large amount of power for the payload. Because the payload, all communications payloads, are, are very power heavy. On the right hand side there, you can see that, of course, the plane had to be lightweight, so it's, car it's very advanced carbon fiber for the body of the plane and for the wings. And something else that we had to bear in mind all the way through was that this aircraft had to be certified for safe flight in civil aerospace. Because as I said, to get up to 60,000 feet, you've got to go through the, the, the whole of the aerospace regime where commercial air aircraft are, are flying. The, the power system is, as I said, hydrogen based, so it's environmentally friendly. Now, we talk about windmills as being environmentally friendly, when, when they work, that is. Um, but there's a lot of energy, a lot of concrete, a lot of steel, a lot of everything else that goes into the makeup of the windmills. Uh, and of course, the same with the plane itself. It's got a lot of carbon fiber, it's got a lot of material, and it's quite a big plane. But the fuel system is entirely environmentally friendly, so th there's no carbon footprint whatsoever from the plane itself when it's operating. And you can see here the two green spheres are representative of the, the hydrogen tanks. You've got two engines which feed off the hydrogen system which goes through the hydrogen conversion with the compressor and the conditioner and other parts of that system and feed those engines. Part of that system was ad adapted from the car industry because of course the car industry is looking uh, and has been for a number of years now at uh, hydrogen for, um, for powering cars. We have patterns on a lot of this technology, of course, including the tank technology. And the bottom line for that power system is that it, it will provide 50 kilowatts of power. Huge amount of power. An average satellite has three or four kilowatts of power. Some of the big comm satellites have a bit more than that, but that's with massive arrays. If you look at the International Space Station, which has solar panels roughly the size of a football pitch, even that only has something like three times the power that we can generate from from uh, our hydrogen system here. So we've got an incredibly efficient system. The communications payload itself, you can see here, this is the, the, the largest 5G airborne antenna in the world. And it's capable of operating at well in excess of 100 gigabits a second, which is super mega fast. So this was designed in Cambridge by Cavendish Lab and by a couple of companies there. Um, and working with, with um, some colleagues of ours as well in, in Germany. The picture you see there um, is uh, a 248 uh, cell phased array antenna. And that's in, its, in the anechoic chamber being tested. And there are eight of those blocks of arrays that fit into the front underneath surface of the aeroplane. And the really, really great thing about that array is, and the, syst the whole system, is that it is instantly compatible with a, uh, with a cell phone. Not only is it compatible with a cell phone, but you don't need any hardware changes or any software changes. And I'll show you the demonstration we did of that uh, in a moment. Because it's a phased array and because it's multi-cell, 
you've got one other big advantage, and that is you can shape the coverage on the ground. What do I mean by that? I mean that it's not just a circular pattern on the ground that you can transmit and receive from, but you can actually focus on particular bits. And this is an example of, of a, a ring freeway to undertaken from a single plane. So one plane can actually produce coverage of cell phones, information, data, text, voice, to that very strange looking ring road there, a strange shape, but you can actually shape that from the airborne antenna. And likewise, one of the problems with, with uh, cell phone coverage, any coverage for that matter, from uh, up high, is that sometimes you're limited by borders between countries. You know, one country will al allow you to, of course, to, to give you full coverage. The country next door won't. So you can stop your coverage very, very easily with this multi-beam uh, cell, cell adapted antenna, as you see in the picture on the left there. So imagine the right-hand side of the whole bunch of squiggly patterns. That represents the, the border where you have to s not transmit beyond. And with one, f with one uh, aeroplane, you can cover, if you don't have any borders, you can cover a complete circular pattern on the ground. You can link them together very easily, as you see in the bottom left-hand picture, into something that is much more uh, useful for uh, country, uh, s uh, continent, global coverage. So that most of that was theory with some design, some testing to destruction and so on. The real proof of whether this whole thing works, of course, then is trying it out. So in October last year, we did our first live demonstration of the system. It was the day we went public, having worked in stealth mode for five years. We got in touch with the media around the world and cell phone operators and all sorts of other organizations. And um, we announced something that we had done a, a few days before, which is that we took a, uh, a standard airplane up to 45,000 feet, which is above the, the stratosphere, and put a, 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 a more straightforward antenna on board it and then we did that. We had two people, with each with a mobile phone, quite some distance apart, and one made a call up to the plane, down again to the other user, and they tried it with text, with voice, with data, and I have to say it worked perfectly. The advantage, by the way, of going up into the stratosphere which is the layer in the atmosphere above the troposphere. So something interesting happens, if you, you may recall from, from uh, your, your days at school uh, when you were doing physics, temperature decreases the higher altitude we go. So if you're, uh, if you're at the top of Thumb Butte on a windy day, it's very cold. If you're at the top of Everest, it's freezing. And the higher you go, the colder it gets. Until you get to somewhere between 35,000 feet and 55,000 feet. Somewhere in there is, is the transition from troposphere to stratosphere, where all of a sudden temperature stops going down, it stabilizes, and then it begins to go up. And the reason for that is because that's the layer in the atmosphere where the UV from the sun begins to heat the atmosphere up. So although the winds can be quite high, they're much more stable. So you've got stable air most of the time for aircraft to fly through. That's why uh, quite frequently uh, when, when you're flying across the Atlantic, the planes w that normally would operate at, say, 35,000 feet try and get up to 40, 41, even 42,000 feet because the air is much more calm there. Also, from that kind of height in the stratosphere, uh, you've got good coverage on the ground, so the, the size of the disk on the ground can be up to 200 kilometers. Uh, in diameter. So you've got high coverage on the ground, you've got a relatively stable altitude for your UAV to be flying, and in fact for this system we're going to be flying at 60,000 feet, way above the height for normal uh, aircraft. I think I, oh sorry, yes, just, just one bit there, 
um, on the right hand side there is is the, the graph of upload speed and download speed from that main test that we did uh, back in October. So we were getting on the very, very first flight, we were getting 70 megabits download and 27 megabits upload, which is incredible really for our very first untuned system. So I'm now going to run um, a couple of videos. Each one runs for about a couple of minutes. I'm not going to talk while the videos are on because you can watch and there are captions that come up. The first one just shows how the plane gets up through uh, commercial airspace. And at some point, if it gets boring, I will sw switch to the next one. Uh, the second video um, is slightly different, but let's see how it goes and uh, I'll move out of the way while it's running. That simulation, by the way, was done by NATS, which is the National Air Traffic Control System in the UK, together with a company called Thales. And NATS is the organization which covers commercial aircraft over the UK and airspace out into the Atlantic. So anything that comes over to the US goes from, from the UK, France, Germany, goes through uh, NATS airspace. So we were obviously uh, very keen to make sure that whatever we were planning had their approval. The second video, uh, which I'll run now, just for a couple of minutes, actually shows you a little bit more about the, what the, pl the plane will do. of this type of technology in the future is going to be direct transmission to your car as you're driving along the freeway or whatever, where you've called up, you want to know what's around the corner, you're going to want to know what the traffic is like a mile ahead, two miles ahead, ten miles ahead. This can communicate with the car instantly and provide you that information. So the schedule that we're working on, remember we've, we've done trials now of the comm system and we'll be doing some more. So we're expecting on the current schedule the first full-scale UAV, so the first one that, that scale composites uh, or uh, other suppliers build will be flying around the fall of next year. That will be a piloted flight. Uh, the first two flights probably will be piloted because before you can get accreditation to fly through commercial airspace, you've got to have a pilot on board uh, for safety reasons. Having got certification for that after the first couple of flights, we'll then be starting the first autonomous flights because at the end of the day, all of these UAVs will be autonomous. So no pilot whatsoever, controlled from the ground, of course, but not c controlled from, from on board. So that'll be around uh, the middle of 2023, so just over two years away. And then we are expecting uh, regional operations 
So countrywide or continent wide in 24, and then global operations probably the year after that, 25 to, to 26. So that's the kind of expectation now on our current schedule. So to finish off um, with the summary before we get into Q&A, we've got a unique, innovative technology that is green as well, which is a, which is a big bonus. But it is truly uh, innovative and calls upon the world-leading technology in a number of areas, in communications, in lightweight, high-altitude aircraft design, and also in power systems that are driven by hydrogen. And what will all that give us? It'll take away the frustration. So I and hopefully billions around the world will no longer need to yell at their cell phones when we go into a dark spot. And it will give us all uh, global connectivity as well. So thank you all for listening and for watching, whether you're here or whether you are online uh, in Prescott or elsewhere in Arizona or the US or indeed overseas. If you have any, more, any questions beyond the Q&A that we're going to get into now, anything you want to follow up on, then please don't hesitate to email me. I'll leave this slide up for a while. Um, it's got my uh, email address there. Or likewise, uh, feel free to contact directly our CEO, uh, Richard Deakin, who a few years ago was the CEO of NATS, the, the uh, National Air Traffic Control System uh, organization. I did say this wasn't an, uh, an investment pitch, but uh, never let a good opportunity go to waste. If you happen to have, let's say, five million in your back pocket and nothing particular to do with it, or if you've got a suitcase with maybe 100 million, maybe 200 million, please feel free to contact us as well. Uh, because we are looking uh, at the next stage of investment. We're talking to a number of organizations, but we're always looking for potential new investors. So thank you very much indeed uh, for listening and watching. And uh, I'll hand back to Dr. Madeline Arya, who um, will, will host the Q&A. Thank you, Richard. Uh, we appreciate you. Uh, uh informing us about an exciting use for unmanned aerial systems. Uh, one of the questions that's already come in, and please uh, go ahead and start uh, typing your, your questions in the chat. But one of the questions is, is, is an interesting one given the fact that we are putting so many satellites up in space. And there's the concern that for astrophotography, because you know if you're in the dark and the satellite's in the, in the, in the sky, you get this reflection. However, you know, we're, we're, we're at 60,000 feet, so my understanding is that really you shouldn't have hardly any time when us as astronomers are down on the ground looking up and a satellite, uh, you know, one of these um, remotely piloted vehicles would be in the, in the sun and kind of ruin our astrophotography. So maybe you want to comment on that real quickly for our astronomy friends? Sure, yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's a very good question. Um, it's a very serious question and, and a well-known problem. So I think there are, there are two aspects. First of all, Yes, there is going to be a small problem with these extra planes, but in, uh, a gra on the ground, looking upwards, in a circle uh, on the ground that's about 100 uh, kilometers in radius, there'll be one plane. Now, if you are in the middle of London and you take a circle of, of 100 kilometers and you look up in the sky um, at least until midnight and starting about four in the morning, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of commercial planes. And they are lower as well. They're, they're going to be much, much lower. So, they, so the problem that we add is infinitely smaller than the problem that, that you already have with commercial uh, flights. Um, so although it's still a, an issue, it's, it's a very small issue. If you compare with satellites, um, the difference there is on scale. So at one point, uh, Elon Musk and SpaceX were planning a constellation of, of 43,000 satellites. And remember, um, up until today, there have been something like 15 to 20,000 satellites launched in the whole of history. So this one constellation that Elon Musk um, is, uh, or is and was uh, proposing to provide, that's 45,000. And the problem you get there is they are all in the same 
set of, uh, there's a standard set of orbital planes, so you get one and then another one, then another one, ad infinitum. Now there's a way around that in part because um, the position of, of all aircraft now flying, and it'll be the same with our UAVs, will be well known and trackable. So actually you'll know when you, in advance, which doesn't help you very much, you'll know in advance though when one's going to go through your line of sight, but you'll know afterwards more particularly that it's been out, uh, gone through your line of sight and therefore you'll know that this streak that you see uh, in your camera image or camera video from your telescope, you'll know that that was a plane. But you have that problem anyway at the moment with, with aircraft. Great. Thanks, Richard. Uh, here, here's another one, uh, interesting one, yeah, and, and it's related to one of the questions I had, but out of curiosity for this fleet of autonomous vehicles, where would they be controlled and monitored from? Are you going to have a control center per country, or how is, it gonna, how is operations going to happen? Yeah, a uh, very good question, of course. Um, and, and the answer is it'll be controlled in exactly the same way as, as airspace is now. So if I take the UK, because I'm more familiar with the numbers there, we will need somewhere between 50 and 100 aircraft to control, give coverage over the whole of the UK. That's 50 to 100 planes that will need controlling, so they've got to get up through uh, commercial airspace, fly around for nine days, and then come back down. All of that will be done from the ground with an autonomous system, but with human beings involved monitoring everything. And that's exactly what happens at the moment with air traffic control for commercial aircraft. And we will not be able to do anything that isn't fully recognized and within the rules and regs and operating scenarios of any air, air traffic control system around the world. So in terms of where it'll be controlled from, it'll be controlled in the UK from either from the same physical facility as commercial aircraft are controlled from over UK airspace or another facility close by but controlled by the same people and the same in the US. So you have a number of ATC centers in the US that control it, your airspace and those will be the ones that will control the, the UAVs. So there'll be no difference whatsoever. And uh, talking about no difference, something I just re remembered, I, I forgot to say, when you're using the system as a cell phone user and you're making a call, your phone, assuming it's a relatively modern phone, will be able to use the UAV, but you won't be aware of the fact that it's going up via UAV as opposed to going through the terrestrial network. And that's a little bit like you have at the moment when you're using um, your cell phone. You have no idea where the tower is that you're using. You know, you know it's, it's, it's generally speaking within 20 miles because that's the limit of transmission of, of, of a cell phone. But if you're transmitting to a, an aeroplane, your cell phone isn't telling you that and you don't need to know that. And the reason why your cell phone can reach much further away to a plane is because the planes have a very powerful transceiver on board so they can receive the very, very minute signals that come down, come up rather, from your, from your cell phone. So it's it'll be completely transparent to you as a user. If you're in this country, by the way, and you want to make a telephone call to, a, a landline call to, let's say, Australia, you have no idea whether it's going through an underground, under, under ocean cable or up through a satellite. Most of the times these days it goes through a satellite. But you don't know, you just want to know that when you pick up the phone and dial Auntie Mabel, that it'll get through to Auntie Mabel. You don't care what route it is. And you won't need to know or care with this system either. What you will know is that you can be in your backyard or at the top of a mountain or in the middle of nowhere in the desert and you'll still get through to Auntie Mabel. So it sounds like the transceivers are a lot more sensitive in this next generation than in Absolutely. the previous generation. Okay. Absolutely right. And I is this going to roll out in the UK, or w where are you going to roll it out first? I, I assume Deutsche Telekom, you're probably yep. somewhere in Europe. So, so Deutsche Telekom is based in Bonn in Germany, and that's where the test flight was done. And it was done simply because it was a, fl a, a plane that they had access to. My guess is, and well, it depends first of all who the next level of investors are. So if they are investors from the UK or from Germany or somewhere else in Europe, the chances are it'll be rolled out uh, there first. Um, so I would say there's a one in three chance it'll, it'll be rolled out in the UK, uh, a one in three Germany and a one in three somewhere else. If it happens to be a major investor, and we've been talking to investors out in the Far East, in the Middle East, as well as in the US and, and Europe, 
uh, wherever they're based, they may say, look, we'll put in 200 million, but we want the, f we want the first rollout to be in, in their location in the world, in which case, fine. But once one system is rolled out, then it's the only limitation in how fast we can roll the system out is how fast the UAV manufacturer can, can produce the planes. A couple other things kind of related to the operations, because especially because I think the video showed some of this, but uh, these are going to be up above the clouds, and, you know, UK, at least our uh, impression is that it rains a lot, and we worry about attenuation. And what, what kind of attenuation do you have from rain? Well, first of all, let me, let me confirm your, your impression, which is it rains a lot in the UK, um, and that's why we spend so much time over here now. Uh, I was saying to somebody else this morning, uh, you can go weeks and weeks in the UK without seeing the sky because, not necessarily because it's raining, but because it's cloudy. Yes, there is antenu uh, in, an attenu attenuation uh, due to, to clouds, but it's actually very, very little. And at the moment, of course, you know, you take um, uh, television programs that you get through satellite. That's, that's all going um, through the clouds wherever in the world you are. Uh, so you can get a TV signal perfectly acceptably with, within um, within the UK, whether it's raining or or, um, or, or whether it's uh, just cl just cloudy. What actually makes a slightly bigger difference if is if it's windy. Hmm. So if you've got trees between you and um, uh, a satellite, and the trees are waving around in the wind, that does affect the transmittability of a bit. But of course, the advantage here is that your your antenna is, or your cell phone uh, antenna is is receiving or transmitting to an aircraft which is much more overhead than um, than a, a direct broadcast mm -hmm. antenna. In the UK, uh, our antennas are only about five degrees above the horizon. Uh, you're more fortunate over over here at lower latitude, but it really really is not going to be a big problem. Yeah, great. I couple more questions, but one uh, question that came from one of the Embry-Riddle graduate students studying uh, unmanned aerial systems. Uh, he's wondering, how would I find out more about this system? I assume that you know, if you go to stratospheriplatforms.com, yep. it, it might have some information? Yeah, actually, that, that's a good point. I sh if I thought of it, I would have put it on here. But yes, if you go to www.stratospheriplatforms.com, that takes you into the company website, and then you can find about the technology, the people, the program, the investors, and, and so on. I mean, of course, because this is still highly innovative technology and commercially classified, it's limited in the amount of, of information that you could take to reverse engineer the system. Uh, we wouldn't be daft enough to do that, but there's a lot of background there. So for those that are interested, have a look at the website, and again, then if there's stuff you want to follow up, feel free to, um, to contact myself or, or Richard Deakin, and um, the well-known phrase we're saying for entrepreneurs is, feel free to ask the question, I'll feel free not to answer it, uh, <laughs> but we'll be as helpful as we can. Yeah. So um, y y in the, I think, especially the first video, you could tell that it looked like there were a couple planes orbiting I uh, in any one given area, and, and maybe that was part of the, the handoff. And so... You know, they're they're flying a small circle with you said probably 100 to 200 kilometer uh, radius of area underneath. Is that a 10 kilometer circle? So they're just doing a, a, a you know kind of the standard loop um, I orbiting. Yeah, it, it, it's a it's a pretty standard loop, and, and you're absolutely right. Where there were two fairly close together, it's because you've got a, a handover between the plane that's come to the end of its nine days. It's got to come back down to refuel. Um, the other plane's got to get be up there, of course, before the, the first one comes back down. Uh, and there may be times when there is so much coverage, particularly over major cities like London, New York, LA, where you might even possibly need, at least for a while, two aircraft to mm -hmm. cover the whole the col whole area if there are s uh, an enough subscribers uh, that want to be able to connect at the same time. Now, of course, you can only predict that by modelling in the first instance. So we've done a lot of modeling on how many planes we need, which is why with the size of, of uh, coverage on the ground, we know for the UK or for a state in the US or for the whole US, we have a pretty good idea on the number of planes um, that we need. Yeah, but so you have got this handover issue as well. Uh, and my guess is that that, that handover itself is going to take probably half an hour, something like that. Because obviously if you're providing a 
what has to be a, a fully reliable service, you've got to make sure that the new plane that's come up really is operational, fully operational, before the other one then then uh, comes back down to, to the ground. So it probably takes, what, uh, half a day, a few hours turnaround to make sure everything is going well? Um, on so on the ground, the turnaround will be in hours. Um, whether it will need to be in hours is, is another matter. Um, but to... To land the plane doesn't actually take all that long, same as it doesn't from an aircraft that's flying at you know, 35,000 feet. It takes typically, what, half an hour before the, the pilot says, right, um, you know, we're, we're now going to begin our descent, so it's half an hour later that you land, uh, unless it's at London Heathrow, in which case you come down and then fly around for an hour while they try and find a gate for you. Um, but that, that's the sort of length of time to come down a bit longer, of course, because you're at 60,000 feet, not 35. On the ground, the plane has to be uh, refueled. It has to be checked out, of course. Uh, various other things have to be done, as they do with an ordinary commercial plane. So in principle, you could probably get the plane up the same day, um, although you wouldn't necessarily need to. So 2024, this might become operational. It sounds like you need some operators, and Embry-Riddle has a lot of UAV students. So we, we will need a lot of operators, for sure. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's one of the things that, in fact, Dr. Hastings was talking about in his talk, in this series of talks uh, yesterday. He was talking about the fact that e even forgetting for the moment COVID, there are so many new opportunities coming up for employment in innovative new technology areas. And with COVID, there's even more uh, innovation going on. So there are lots of opportunities for, for new students. And you know, I, I've given a lot of talks over the last 10 years to, to students at different levels. And one thing I've always said, if you, uh, if you study engineering and you get a degree of engineering, you can almost guarantee you will never be out of a job because in, in the whole of the Western world, probably the whole globe, we are desperately short still of engineers. My problem when I ran the space laboratory near Oxford for 17 years wasn't insufficient funding, it was getting enough engineers. And universities like Embry-Riddle, the more engineers you can provide, the better. Because, um, you know, e engineering is always exciting. There's always a unique challenge and there's always interesting stuff to do. Uh, and there's always a job for you at the end. It's very interesting that p in the UK, Parents now are making more of a decision on what their kids will do when they go to university, not based on what they, the old fashioned, well, let's go into advertising, let's go into the media or whatever, but let's go into something where you can be pretty sure of getting a job afterwards, and engineering is that field. Well, that's, that's great. And plus, you know, again, really thank you for, for coming. This is the topic is just perfect for an aeronautical university, whether you're an aerospace engineer who wants to design this, a computer electrical software engineer who's interested in the, the shaping of the antennas, an unmanned aerial systems major who, of course, this is a dream for them to have an operation like this. ATC, we have, we have almost the whole gamut of what it takes to support something like this and even an aviation business administration. Uh, major here. So we've kind of come to the five o'clock time. Uh, I wanted to thank our speaker. So, you know, if, if you're at home, please do your invisible clapping. We appreciate <laughs> it. And we look forward to having you, if not the, this spring, but uh, maybe next year when you come back for some good weather again next year, year. So thank you all in the audience for joining and for your questions. And uh, have a great Engineers Week. And thank you very much indeed for me. Thank you for hosting the talk, Dr. Meller. And um, and uh, as I said earlier on, don't, don't uh, hesitate to contact me, any of you out there listening, if you have any questions. Excellent.